In 1990, when Saxony was still in East Germany, it was in many respects a place where little seemed to have changed since the end of the Second World War. The old German Democratic Republic was still in existence. The Soviet army was firmly in control and hardly anybody could afford a car. As we filmed the narrow gauge railways, the first thing that struck us was the fact that they were not really tourist lines, but a serious means of transport for the local people who regularly used them to commute to work and go shopping. In marked contrast to most narrow gauge railways in Western Europe, whose visitors arrive by car and treat the railway as a fun fair ride. The idea of a romantic railway seemed slightly inappropriate here. Passengers struggled through all weathers to catch their trains. The railway staff did their best to keep themselves warm and their paperwork dry, while several small towns were regularly smothered in thick coal smoke as the trains plied their streets. Not exactly romantic, but certainly a fascinating scene for the outsider to observe. A transport time warp to be recorded without delay before imminent political change altered things for good. We decided to start in the southeast of the country, reporting first on the narrow gauge lines around Zittau. Although the railway served two hill resorts, the lower section ran through an industrial area. In 1990, the trains still had the slightly drab atmosphere typical of an ordinary local railway. At the clumsily named Oberstdorf Niederdorf, the guard whistled the right away for a train which is frequent enough to be regarded as a tram service. Hourly most of the day, increasing to half hourly mornings and evenings.
we joined the locals for a ride over the Olbersdorf rooftops towards the junction at Bertsdorf, where the Eubin and Jonsdorf lines diverge. The carriages are quite spacious and remarkably steady, considering the track gauge is a mere 750 millimetres. Bertsdorf station, with its arched canopy, is a great favourite with narrow-gauge fans. The train for Korot Eubin pulls in while the connection for Korot Jonsdorf waits alongside. All the locomotives at Zittau are pre-war 2102 tanks, the first Reichsbahn narrow-gauge standard design introduced in 1928. Pièce de Résistance at Bertsdorf is the simultaneous departure of the Jonsdorf and Eubin trains. They are officially timetabled to leave two minutes apart, but often, in fact, leave together. After Bertsdorf, both branches assume a more rural aspect, and the Jonsdorf line makes a sharp right curve as it climbs through dense forest. Early spring weather can revert to winter in seconds, as we discovered on reaching the branch terminus at Kurort Jonsdorf, just 12.7 kilometers from Zittau. A popular holiday resort in summer, the Lausitzer Gebirge close to the Czech frontier was pretty bleak in early March. There seemed to be no passengers at all for the one o'clock departure at Zittau, until, at the last minute, a beleaguered school party made a dash for the train, which the guard kindly held for them. Back at the junction station of Bertsdorf, the weather was just as bad, 
as the Jonsdorf branch locomotive was being prepared for its next trip. The next day saw the end of the winter weather and a sunny spring day greeted our visit to the Oibin branch. Kuroit Oibin, 12.2 kilometers from Zittau, with ruined castles and high crags, is scenically more interesting than Oibin and attracts more visitors, as the number of passengers at the station demonstrates. The Tsitawa network nearly closed in 1990 due to a plan by the then DDR government to expand the nearby open-cast coal mine. This would have severed the line completely. A diversion would not only have been too expensive to build, but would have made the train journeys too long as well. The area south of Tsitawa would have looked something like this, with dragline excavators devastating the land for miles around. Fans of the narrow gauge might have had some consolation in the form of an electrified mine railway like this one at Espenheim, with the 900 mm gauge electric locomotive so typical of brown coal excavation. But the unification of Germany shifted the economic balance away from the traditional smokestack industries with their insatiable appetite for large quantities of brown coal. The Zittau open cast extension was cancelled, and to the huge relief of the narrow gauge fans, the lines to Jonsdorf and Oibin were saved. In the brown coal areas of eastern Germany, many of the factories have traditionally used fireless locos. This is because normal locos burning lignite would produce unhealthy sulfurous fumes that would be unacceptable in the confined spaces between factory buildings. These shots were taken at the now closed Orvo film works at Wolfen near Bitterfeld. Fireless locos are cheaper to run, not only because they have no boiler to maintain, but also because they need no firemen. They perform just as well as a conventional locomotive and under average conditions will give about three hours service after being recharged at a steam supply point. We shall now visit a forgotten corner of Saxony, halfway between Leipzig and Dresden. Oschatz is typical of many small country towns in the DDR whose neglected old buildings show the peeling names of family businesses forced to close by the communist regime in the 50s, along with the names of the ostensibly democratic political parties that failed to prevent communism in the first place. 
but dereliction and backwardness can have its consolations, at least for the railway enthusiast. The 750mm gauge railway at Oschatz is the last surviving link in what was once the largest narrow gauge network in Saxony. The hub of the network was at Mügeln, whence four routes radiated. A program of closures began in 1964, and by 1975 all passenger service had ceased. But the stretch from Oschatz to Chemlitz was retained for freight. Although it is no longer a junction, Mugeln has retained its status as an operational centre. The line is still worked in two parts with all trips originating and terminating in Mugeln. The early morning freight train from Oschatz is seen arriving with the typical rake of standard gauge wagons on narrow gauge flat cars. When we filmed here in 1990, there were four round trips a day on the line and four engines were normally kept in steam. The locomotives used at Mugel are the unique Saxon Meyer 0440 compound articulateds. They were designed and built at the Richard Hartmann works in Chemnitz between 1892 and 1921. The engines here were all part of a batch supplied in 1912. A minor technical curiosity here was the use until 1987 of the Haberline brake system, involving a cable running on pulleys across the top of the locos and wagons. This was once the standard brake system on the Saxon narrow gauge and the Mugeln line was the last to use it. The Haberline fittings still remained on this loco, but had been removed from all the others, giving the engines in their later years a less cluttered look. This was a trip from Mugeln to the terminus at Chemnitz. Typically of the old DDR, the traffic build-up while the level crossing was closed amounted to just one Travi and a Polsky Fiat. As the train approached the halt at Nevichen, it passed the old station restaurant, now just a private house. The friendly train crew beckoned us on board for a trip in the guard's van up to Chemnitz. From here, one could see the passing loop on the alignment of the former branch to Neichen, while our train curved away on what was left of the line to Kroptivitz. As the guard dutifully logged his train's brief stop at the now non-existent junction at Nevichen, the train attacked the steep climb towards Chemnitz. It is on this section that the little Saxon Myers proved the worth of their design, climbing steadily without a trace of slip despite the wet weather.
High speeds are of little importance here. What matters is that the loco runs smoothly without laboring on a slow climb. On arrival at Kemblitz, the loco was kept busy for some time, shunting wagons at the two factories here, which formed the state-owned Kemblitz Kaolin Works. It was this enterprise, with its nearby quarry, which had kept the railway active in recent decades. Without it, the line would surely have shut in 1975 with the last of the passenger services. One advantage of the old command economy was that all the factory output went by rail, which meant that on average, Four trains a day came to Camlitz. One of the sidings involved a switchback and a steep climb, which made shunting operations quite interesting to observe. The siding led to the upper factory at Kemlitz, where refined kaolin was produced for the ceramics industry. works here even had its own tiny diesel loco to save the steam engine the trouble of shunting the upper yard. We now take a ride on the return trip to Oshans and savour once more the atmosphere of narrow gauge steam in the DDR. Black Cat on the track is hopefully a good omen for the line's future. On arrival in Oshatz, our train encounters virtually no traffic in this quite sizable town, which, like so many other places in the DDR, is eerily quiet.
Our freight has now arrived in Oshatz Yard, situated beside the main Leipzig to Dresden main line. The narrow gauge loco, which has been on shunting duty here, is ready to leave with the last freight of the day. The other loco, which has just arrived, will return to Mügeln at the head of the same train, making it a double header. This was a regular feature of the line, designed to get all locos back to the shed at Mügeln at the end of the day, and was, of course, a great attraction for the rail fan. One of only two working signals left on the railway, the semaphore on the approach to Mugel was duly raised for the double header. It was now 4.30 on a wet March afternoon, and time for the daily ritual of putting the locomotives away for the night. Number 1574 has been cold and watered after working the last afternoon trip to Chemlitz, and is first to be put away in the shed. Then it is the turn of the two locos off the double header starting with number 1564.
fireman and the depot cleaner shovel coal onto the conveyor while the driver goes home in his trabi. The scene could have been taken at least 40 years earlier, as several engines shunted about simultaneously. By five o'clock, the evening ritual was over, and the crews went home, leaving a shed full of 80-year-old Saxon Myers simmering through the night to await the next day's tour of duty. A rare sight indeed, but how long would it last? Following rumours of imminent closure, we visited the line again in March 1993. At first sight, everything seemed just as before. But in fact, a lot had changed in the intervening three years. The railway had been taken over by the DBDR Joint Administration, whose first act was to change the locomotive numbers. This eliminated the gaps between the previous numbers, which had been based on the Saxon originals. Another practical, but less aesthetic change, was the replacement of the old round-topped wooden locoshed doors by modern metal ones. In keeping with the times, the train driver's trabis had now become opals. Immediately noticeable was the new rule requiring all the yard staff to wear bright orange boiler suits, in keeping with Western practice. But despite appearances, the traffic being handled here in Mugeln Yard was less than half the level of three years before, throwing the line's viability into serious doubt. On this March 1993 visit, there were only two trains a day instead of four on the Oschatz to Mugeln section, and the Chemnitz branch was down from four trains a day to one. Much of the Kaolin traffic had been lost to road competition. Heavy lorries from the Netherlands were now regularly trundling over the rails of the branch to the upper factory at Chemnitz, which now seemed to have no rail traffic at all. The main factory still sent out some Kaolin to Poland by rail, but the amounts were small and irregular, and it took some luck to get a shot of a train arriving at Chemnitz.
It looked as though some trains were run simply to give the staff something to do. At least the citizens of Mugeln were getting some advantage from the changes in the form of a working telephone system and certain other Western benefits. But for the railwaymen in Mugeln Yard, the future was bleak. The Oshatz line was all that was left of a once extensive network and the older railwaymen remembered the passenger service closing in the 60s. Yeah, Mugeln. Yeah, Mugeln. The old telephones in the yard office still bore the names of long-forgotten lines that once ran to Mugel. Nowadays, the staff was down to just 20 men who only worked a morning shift and packed up for the day at lunchtime. One relic of the old days was the operation of coal traffic to Walter Lessig's yard in Mugel. The wagons usually arrived about twice a week and were shunted across the street to the coal yard. Period DDR flavour came in the form of a tiny three-wheeler car. The driver managed to stall his engine while stopping for the coal shunt. But our friendly shunter in his brand new orange safety suit gallantly came to the rescue and saw him on his way. The black cat we saw on the line in 1990 was, after all, a good omen for the railway to Mugeln, though not for the steam lover. In January 1994, the railway was privatised, being leased to the Mansfelder Bergwerk Gesellschaft. The company immediately introduced diesel locomotives, finally bringing to an end the last surviving non-tourist steam operation in Europe to use truly vintage locomotives. In an era when rationalization and the threat of closure seem to be inevitable for so many railways, it is heartening to be able to record one that has reopened. The location is the Hart Mountains National Park in central Germany, which until recently was divided by the old East German border. The ancient forests form the setting for many Teutonic legends and are dear to the heart of many Germans. Rising up above the tree line is the Brocken Mountain, highest point in the hearts and favorite destination for ramblers and weekenders for generations past. But for over 30 years, this was forbidden territory. Lying right on the east-west border, the Brocken had been sealed off to civilians as its elevation provided a perfect location for the Russians to place a radio and satellite surveillance base at this western extremity of communist Europe. So sensitive was the area, it was the only part of the old Iron Curtain to have had a high concrete wall similar to the one that notoriously divided Berlin. Reunification of the two halves of Germany made the border installations redundant, and the whole area, with its rich natural beauty, became freely accessible once more. Their newfound freedom brought the ramblers back in their thousands, keen to enjoy the unspoiled attractions of an area denied them for a whole generation. But the forest had been badly damaged by the Russian military, and the hordes of tourists were hardly likely to assist in the process of regeneration. In fact, their presence was considered a threat to the very beauty they had come for miles to see. Fortunately, the conservationists soon found the perfect answer to the problem. All they had to do was reopen the old railway that used to run up to the Brocken summit. By this means, they could reduce the impact on the mountain trails to sustainable levels. By converting the old Russian army base at the top 
to a tourist amenity area, they could save the rest of the forest around the Brocken from undue disturbance, while not actually preventing people from going there. The meter-gauge steam railway between the towns of Wernigerode and Nordhausen had its branch to the Brocken cut for many years, and the trains only served the edge of the forest areas. At last, the Hartz Railway could come into its own once more. With due pomp and circumstance, the people of the province of Saxony-Anhalt gathered at the Schierke station to celebrate the end of its temporary role of terminus, as it once again became a wayside halt en route to the Brocken. ceremonially cut, the first train to the Brocken for 30 years was clear to leave on its historic journey. Symbolically piercing the old wall on its climb to the summit, the train rounded the final curve, which had previously placed some 400 metres of the track in the territory of West Germany, thus preventing the line's use throughout the Cold War years. Ecstatic crowds awaited the arrival of the first of three inaugural specials. As the flag of German unity was hoisted, yet another brass band was in attendance, playing a familiar tune not heard on the Brocken since 1945. On this inaugural day, there wasn't actually much to see. The euphoria of the occasion somewhat overshadowed the reality, as none of the viewpoints or laid out paths had yet taken shape. The process of cleaning up after the Russians had not even started, for the very good reason that they were still there. The Russian withdrawal from Europe had taken so long that many of their bases, including the one on the Brocken, remained manned until well into the 90s and were the object of much curiosity on the part of local visitors, amused to see their former occupiers forlornly waiting in their compound to go home. The immediate surroundings of the Brocken will take time to restore, but outside the base area, the hillsides remained unspoilt and provided a fascinating opportunity for naturalists to study the so-called fighting zone where plants on the limit of the tree line have to fight for survival with no more than gorse scrub for protection. Despite the efforts of a sizable environmental lobby opposed to the transport of tourists by railway, this exercise in ecotourism has been a success. The railway has reclaimed its former territory and played an important part in turning this one-time communist satellite spy station back into one of Germany's major tourist attractions.